Thank you, Marjorie. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be back here at the DG World Summit, and, uh, and I'm thrilled by the challenge of getting you into this trust and blockchain perspective conversation with Joseph and Olaf. Uh, the challenge of introducing such a topic in 10 minutes is a huge one, and both trust and blockchains are still very flexible and often misunderstood notions. We have covered yesterday many facets of trust across uh, the industry at large, uh, in including trust in the future, as it was epitomized by our two past icons, Igor and Grishka. Still, the essence of trust does not only rely on technology, but in people first. How many of you have read this book by Professor Yuval Harari called Sapiens? Please raise your hands. Come on. We you should, you should, you should read that people. book. Because this book, and I guess that Joseph and Olaf have at least heard about it, Sapiens is all about how the human species emerge from others by its unique ability uh, to make it possible for people to cooperate at a very large scale, including with remote strangers. And trust actually is the core enabler, is the cement of such cooperation as it applies to people, actions, and processes as well. So in order to adapt this panel to the audience, I need to know more about you guys in the room for three questions. The first one is, how many of you have Bitcoins? Please raise your hands. Come on, Olaf, you're trading them. OK. How many, of you have, how many of you have Ethers? OK. How many of you think, therefore, that you have understood anything about blockchain? OK, that's reassuring. <laughs> And so I will add a fourth question. How many of you know who is the guy above? OK, we please. We have one winner. <laughs> please mean Mark Andreessen, uh, founder of Netscape, so one of the icons of the early internet age, who made this very interesting parallel between what blockchain and, and, and TCP IP, the, the foundational protocols of the internet, are. Actually, he used this analogy two and a half years ago. And it's a quite interesting one, because in both cases, we are facing a usage-neutral technology that insiders identified very early as extremely disruptive and applying potentially to many, many various different use cases, yet not having reached critical mass, as internet was still unknown by the general public in, in the 90s. There are still two core differences. One, the internet is a very efficient information and content copy machine, and we'll get back to that. While blockchain is all about transactions. And two, internet was, wasn't as much covered by the media as blockchain is nowadays. Uh, and that is the result. We are facing a very difficult topic to frame that still generates lots of misunderstanding and misinterpretation uh, all across the place, including in the corporate place. Why is it difficult? Because it is incredibly complex, but also because it challenges in lots of ways, conventional corporate wisdom. This is particularly true in large organizations as well as in the public sector, and it's very, very true in France. How many, peop how many French people in the room? Please raise your hands. OK, you might not know it, but we all French people, including myself, have and suffer to various extents from a 17th century cultural genetical disease that was spread by Descartes. We French love concepts. We love framing com complex issues into simple formulas. We love trying to make headlines. And it turns out that blockchain, almost in a malicious way, consistently resists any attempt for intellectual reduction. So we need to be humble. And even the now famous cover by The Economist could be interpreted in, in various ways. So briefly, blockchain is first about ledgers. And, and in a way, it's transforming and morphing uh, a cornerstone of what has been modern trade and finance as we have known it for the past 450 years. But who knows the guy in the painting? Please raise your hands. I mean, Nadia, you heard, you've heard me enough. OK, and OK, there's a second one, third one. So this guy is Luca Pacioli. He, he lived in Venice 
and he was a Franciscan monk, and he's deemed to be the inventor of double entry, double entry accounting. So he is, in a way, the evidence that in Europe, you can still define, and in continental Europe, you can still define uh, trading and financial systems on a long time, over a long time. Uh, blockchain is also about decentralization. And here I will just observe that decentralization is not new at all. All the telco representatives in this room know exactly what I mean. And this is a, a way where Mike and Rissen's remarks are extremely relevant. But there is a third element that lots of people would like to forget about. And it's what secures actually the transactions. As we saw, internet is a fantastic copy infrastructure. Whenever I send an email to Olaf, whenever I take a picture of the audience and send it to Nadia, actually I'm just copying content. I'm duplicating information. The media industry has a long experience of what this means for them. Now let's make an experiment. If I pick this 20 euro banknote that you can all see and hand it over to Joseph, you will understand that implicitly the reason why our whole financial system still holds is that without any of you asking any questions, you all admit that one, this 20 euros banknote is unique, two, it has left my pocket, it has reached Joseph's pocket, and there is no copy of it in my pocket. There is no double spend. And the whole problem in the internet as a copy machine, when you want to not copy information but tra transfer value, is to fight against double spend and make sure that there is no duplicated version of an asset that has been left behind. What secures the whole transaction system and avoids such double spend is the crypto asset that is above. You can name it Bitcoin, you can name it Ether. The most secure public blockchain implementations at large scale rely on a digital asset that is both the transaction token and the reward mechanism for securing the, the ledger and the network and make such ledger untemperable, which means that everybody can trust the transactions that are irrevocably recorded in it. So where are we now? Blockchains as transaction infrastructures are therefore re redefining how we operate trust and reduce frictions in the, digital, in the digital age, but they challenge us all as public blockchains operate on open source software and aside any governmental framework or regulatory body. There might be, from place to place, promises of private or permission blockchains, there are even attempts to design blockchains without any cryptocurrency. But the fact of the matter is that for now, the most robust, resilient blockchains over time involve a cryptocurrency to enable trust. Remember that Bitcoin turned seven years old in early January, and that the core network arch architecture since day one has never been compromised. And that leads us to the question, what makes us uneasy when it comes to large organizations or public institutions. What makes us distrust the trust machine? I think it's not only about cryptocurrency. I think it's not only about open source software, which is free, where the consensus in this room is that what is free has no value. I think it is linked to how all of this emerged in a context of strong distrust in the system. When Satoshi Nakamoto whomever she, she is or he is or they are, published his white paper that is just displayed above on the left on a peer-to-peer -peer, um, decentralized cash system, electronic ca cash system. And when he provided the source code to implement it, he never asked permission to anybody. When Vitalik Buterin in 2013, when he was aged 19, 19 years old boy, decided to launch a crowdsourcing campaign, a crowdfunding campaign on Bitcoin to provide the resources to deploy his, virtual, his worldwide virtual machine and raise the equivalent of $18 million, Vitalik never asked permission to anybody. When the DAO in late spring performed the largest fundraising ever for an investment fund 
reaching the equivalent in Ether of almost $160 million, they had no LPs, they had no regulatory body, they had no investment thesis in the way usually VC handle them, they had no soft cap, no hard cap, they had nothing. They never asked permission to anybody. And this is, I think, why we are un uneased. So my advice to you guys, if you want to explore this topic, and you should, is one, to be humble and to be convinced that you don't know anything about it. Two, to be curious and to keep updated. Three, to explore by yourself with no prior assumptions and be technology agnostic. And four, to explore together. And this is what we have launched a year ago with Nadia, my colleague, who is in the room and who co-leads our lab chain initiative around Caisse des Depots. Caisse des Depots discovered that as a neutral institution, it was unbiased and could not be suspected of any uh, hidden agenda in gathering competitors that are major French banks and major French insurance companies. We were 11 when we started. We are now 25 and counting. And we are testing use cases on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Hyperledger.